Good morning and aloha everybody. Uh, welcome to an informational briefing regarding the role of culture and the arts in Hawaii, especially during this time of the pandemic. Uh, to start us off this morning, um, I'd like to ask Snowboard Bento to um, provide us with some inspiration. Mahalo. Kau kahali ai ta mana wala he ia moe ta uhoa o na oe O oe o halaula ni oa kale i mehe manu e kani nei i tua i i tua alama Tu o maha i le hua ku moho e e e awai i luna i you call you me oe ela kai kana hele hele you are kana no ya is why is why e ho ima aloha aloha and thank you for that i'm senator brian taniguchi um chair of the senate committee on labor culture and the arts. Uh, joining us are committee members, uh, Senator Les Ihara Jr., Senator Stanley Chang, Senator Jarrett Keoho Kalole, and Senator Kurt Ovella. Also joining us are Representative Cedric Gates, who is the chair of the House Committee on Culture and the Arts, and Jonathan Johnson, the executive director of the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts. This meeting is being live streamed by the Hawaii State Senate. The link is available on the hearings notice posted on the legislature's website at www.capital.hawaii.gov. As this is a virtual platform, please mute your microphone until you are recognized and use your video camera if you are able. We, if we experience any technical difficulties, we may have to briefly recess the meeting to correct the problem. Please bear with us. While we are not able to accept public testimony at this informational briefing, uh, you are welcome to submit comments and questions to the committee members. Our email addresses are listed on the legislature's website. To get started, may I first introduce again, Jonathan Johnson, the executive Director of the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts. AJ. Good morning and aloha. Chair Taniguchi, Chair Gates, members of the committees and the creative resurgence. I'm Jonathan Johnson, Executive Director of the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts, the state's arts agency. The role of the state art agency and the reason government is involved in the arts is to ensure access to the arts for all people across the state, in every community, not just Honolulu. Our focus is on geographic and economically underserved. Why? Because participation and creativity ensures a healthy community. Hawaii's cultural organizations play a major role in what makes our island home special. As Hawaii faces the effects of the public health crisis, we recognize the culture and arts field is particularly vulnerable to the economic impact of this emergency. We also know we're one of the most innovative sectors, as you will hear today. And I'm confident with their creativity, we will find a way through this time. In Hawaii, we're fortunate to have both the support of the administration and the legislature. Thank you. Uh, working together, we will emerge, albeit we'll be different than before the crisis. So today, we will hear from cultural organizations and creatives statewide that are demonstrating tremendous ingenuity and generosity as communities strive to stay safe and healthy. In recognizing the state's budget crisis, I'm particularly interested in hearing about the agenda of partnerships and opportunities for shared goals brought forward by these creatives. So mahalo, and this is gonna be really fun. Take care. Mahalo Nui, Jonathan. Aloha mai kako. 
My name is Lala Nas. I come to you from Honouli Uli and Hilo. My background interweaves the global tourism and hospitality industry, nonprofit and grassroots community development, regenerative entre entrepreneurship, creative arts programming, environmental resilience, and equity advocacy initiatives. I come to you today as a Kikyo Kaina and community member. And I have the privilege of being your facilitator for today's program. There we are, we, now we can see each other. Wanted to uh, first and foremost, before we get into the program, send a big mahalo nui to Senator Tanaguchi, the Senate Committee for Labor, Culture and the Arts, and staff for officially hosting this virtual event and providing technical support. Today, we'll be exploring through stories and artistic expression, the breadth and depth of Hawaii's creative sector that expands thousands of years and thousands of miles. Mahalo to everyone for showing up to share, dream, advocate, and imagine together in this important discussion today. For today's program, we're honored, excited, and grateful to have almost a half a dozen, or actually a dozen individual Hawaii artists and creatives offering their invaluable time and energy in contributing to this initiative, especially during these unprecedented times. I wanna acknowledge the historic challenges we find ourselves in presently, uh, a globally impactful experience being felt in so many different ways, from public health to economy and everything in between. Uh, I want to honor and uplift our frontline workers and those who continue tirelessly to provide relief and recovery for those being impacted the hardest. Today, we will have the opportunity to hear from voices that embody the brilliance of Hawaii's creative practices and cultural knowledge, pointing to the reasons why a state caucus dedicated to representing the creative sector is so crucial and timely to establish in 2021. In the spirit of collective creativity and bringing creativity into the room. Um, I brought a piece of art gifted to me by an amazing, talented local artist behind me, as you can see, uh, Culture, Shock, Culture Shaka or Justin Tanaka. I invite all of you for a moment to think about a time in your life that the arts and creative sector impacted you. Was it watching your child's performance at a school play or dance recital, a song sung at a family's wedding, an arts exhibition you discovered with your family, or a craft you learned and refined with other artists. Now think about your life, our communities. What would they look like without the arts in the creative sector? No theater, concerts, live performances, virtual programs, film, dance, etc. And now imagine what your life our community's well-being would look, sound, feel, taste, be like with a thriving creative sector. Now I invite you to carry that thought into throughout today's session. Families, cultures, businesses, careers, and knowledge are all built upon acts of creation, making creativity central to our society, culture, and very way of life and well-being. Throughout the pandemic, the shelter and the sheltering orders, the creative sector has revealed itself as the second responders, catalyzing critical response efforts, virtual arts education and experiences, commerce and professional development. For myself, I grew up exposed to the arts in some way, shape or form, whether learning to dance hula, experiencing culture through museums and theaters, theater shows in other cities, or witnessing my mother, Paula Helfrich, assist in establishing the Hawaii State Art Museum over 20 years ago. As a member and informal yet official uh, creative resurgence, Hui, that emerged out of the COVID-19 pandemic, I take great pleasure in introducing one of our founding Hui members and an inspiring peer. Our first presenter and speaker today is Dr. Akemi Glenn. She's a Honolulu-based scholar and culture worker. She's a linguist who works in indigenous language revitalization and a filmmaker, artist, and cultural practitioner. Akemi is also the founder and executive director of the Popolo Project, 
an organization whose mission is to redefine what it means to be Black in Hawaii and in the world through cultivating connections between individuals, our communities, our ancestors, and the land, changing what we commonly think of as local and highlighting the vivid, complex diversity of Black culture and identity. Without further ado, Akemi will share a bit more about the creative resurgence hui and her reason for creative sector advocacy. Mahalo Akemi for being here. Mahalo Lala, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you to everyone for giving us the space today to share a little bit about our hui and why we think it's so important for us to have a caucus to think about some of the issues and ideas that have come from our creative sector as Hawaii moves forward. Um, as Lala mentioned, we're a part of a group called Creative Resurgence. We started in the early days of this pandemic in April, meeting every week um, together with a friend and colleague who's a part of this group, uh, Dr. Luafata Simanu Klutz, who is the director of Pacific Islanders in the Arts. We realized that as all of us were trying to make sense of what was happening around us in the early days of COVID here in Hawaii, that all of us were also turning to the arts. We were um, going onto Netflix and watching everything we could to soothe us. We were playing music that mattered. We were digging deeply into our ethnic cultures and finding sustenance in the food that our parents made for us. And it seemed as we were building and as people were trying to figure out what we were, what we were doing and how we were going to maintain through this pandemic, that the arts, our cultures, um, the creative urge of our, of our communities was central to how we were making it through. And this group uh, just started from an invitation that Fata and I put out to people in our community, artists, individuals, institutions. We invited them just to talk story with us. And that's also a creative act here in Hawaii and something that we really prize is listening intentionally, but also building a common understanding together. So over several, several months, we started in April, uh, shortly after the lockdowns began, meeting every single week, a very diverse group of people, many of whom didn't know each other from very different backgrounds, started to find ways that we would be able to coalesce and understand each other and share values around this concept that creativity is central to our survival. Um, this group has become dynamic and has organically grown and changed in the time that we've spent together. And I won't take too much more time because I think the speakers who are coming after me will really demonstrate to you the true value of why we need this caucus. But I think it is important to say that our group Creative Resurgence has found in the sharing and talking story over these several months that we do have some values in common. First is this idea that Hawaii itself is a creative place. It's not just a place that creatives live, but the aina itself is in constant acts of creation. And we can see that all around us and we are inspired by it. And we also thrive because of it. All of us have the creative urge within us. Um, we know that from you know the most well-produced and high quality productions that we see here in Hawaii across the state to the most informal backyard pa'inas, that creativity is really important to how we connect with each other, how we understand ourselves, and how we can imagine a future going forward. So in our small group meeting every single week since April, we've used this opportunity to identify places for us to put our energy in our respective organizations and communities. Um, one of the things that we've done is organize as a collective and um, apportioned out different kinds of work for our group. Um, one of our groups, um, work in, internal working groups, uh, spends its time trying to help us stay on the same page with our messaging and think through these values and make sure that they're central to the work that we do. One of our groups is in charge of developing a small micro grants program that's actually launching today um, in the community of Kalihi on Oahu and in the community of Hana on Maui, um, giving actual money and support to, um, to really kind of uplift the creative efforts that our community members are doing, whether they are working artists or people who just have a wonderful hobby and something that brings life to them and, and the people around them. Um, one of our groups is um, kind of tasked with keeping their eyes open for new opportunities that might emerge on, on the landscape as things change in this uncertain time and really thinking about ways that we can make an impact as a group collectively. And that group is responsible for the program that we see today. And I wanna thank all of them for their hard work in thinking through how we could take these 
um, these wide ranging and really rich conversations that we've had since April and bring them to our community in a very um, impactful way through our connections with our, our state legislators. So um, without too much more from me, I'd love to turn it back over to Lala and, um, and have you hear from artists and practitioners and others who've been doing this thinking along with us and uh, really want to encourage our legislators and others to think about how this creative urge that is evidenced all around us. We see this in the, the nature that we live in. We see this in the ocean. We see this in the land. We see it every single day. Um, how we can really center that and not only center it because of the economic benefit, but the way that it reaffirms our humanity in a time when we all truly need it. Mahalo. Mahalo nui Kimi. Thank you so much for your contributions and solidarity um, in supporting our Black, Indigenous, and Pacific Islander communities throughout your life's work. Um, you know, we're using the word creative very broadly um, to be inclusive of diverse arts and cultural traditions and genres that are dynamic and fluid in practice. Um, in Western framework, the arts and humanities are separated disciplines. Um, in an Asia Pacific worldview, they're integrated and evolving in creative practices and professions. Uh, many cultures and languages don't have a word for art because creativity is so intimately interwoven into the fabric of our societies. Up next, we have Dr. Terry Skillman, the CEO uh, for the Hawaii Arts Alliance. She earned her PhD and MA in ethnomusicology from the UH Manoa Music Department. She's worked as an artist, um, an arts administrator and educator for 30 years, teaching in international schools in New Delhi, uh, Kuala Lumpur and Abu Dhabi, and lecturing at UH in ethnomusicology and music education. As an art administrator, she developed public programs and exhibits for the Judi Judiciary History Center, Hawaii Manoa Hamilton Library, Museum Studies and Historic Preservation, and the Center for South Asia Studies. Um, I, have the, I had the pleasure of meeting and working with Terry during the 2019 Honolulu Biennial, for those that may be familiar with that, um, which is now known as Hawaii Contemporary. Uh, Terry will be providing insight into economic importance of our creative sector. Mahalo, Terry, for being here. Mahalo nui lala and thank you Senator Taniguchi for hosting this meeting for us to share. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, the Creative Research Group, as Akiemi um, indicated, has three subgroups and the Emergent Strategies Group is the one uh, in which I have been working with Lala and Fata uh, and several others for the last several months. We were inspired by the author Adrian Marie Brown's book, Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds. Um, the Emergent Strategies Group decided then to work on a proposal for a creative caucus at the Hawaii State Legislature. Uh, we looked at the caucuses that are already functioning and we were inspired by the Women's Caucus and the Keiki Caucus. We were also driven by the stories of gig workers and artists who were devastated by COVID and unable to receive PUA or unemployment. We noticed that there were no bills in the last legis legislative session for creative sector. And since the pandemic, the narrative in the media has focused on the um, devastation of the tourist industry, including hotels and restaurants. Both of these venues employ local artists as gig workers for entertainment and to present programs. Artists play so many roles in society. In Hawaii, many of us have two jobs because the salaries are so low for the high cost of living. Artists almost always have two jobs, one to pay the bills and one to express the soul. Worker, <clears throat> artists are workers, and that's important for us to acknowledge. Can you fill in a blank statement? I am a working artist and a, for example, I am a working artist and a domestic worker, an Uber driver, an educator, a chef, a parent, an arts administrator. In the same way, <clears throat> arts and cultural organizations such as museums are small to medium-sized businesses that employ artists on contract or as gig workers if they are not organizational employees in order to present programs for the public. We all rely on the creative sector and especially the gig workers. 
During the pandemic, healthcare workers and essential workers have been our first responders. They have been working hard to save our lives. The second responders are the creatives in our community who have pivoted to providing creative virtual programming to keep us positive and sane. In the Creative Researchers Caucus proposal, the goals are articulated in broad themes of advocacy, access and education, creative spaces, state policies and taxes. We encourage the public to read the proposal and sign in support of creating a Creative Resurgence Caucus at the legislature. Um, this is visible on the Hawaii Arts Alliance uh, website if you haven't been able to access it. The proposal does not request funds, but rather seeks changes in existing laws or seeks new policies that will better recognize and support the creative economy in Hawaii. The creatives want to step up and help the community to recover and move forward. We want to be a, a contributing sector for a more positive direction in the state's recovery. <clears throat> According to the Americans for the Arts study that was done in 2017, uh, Hawaii generated $205.6 million in total economic activity in the arts. Nonprofit arts and cultural organizations spent 125.9 million. In addition, <clears throat> there was 79.7 million was uh, event related spending by the audiences attending those programs. This supported almost 6,000 full-time equivalent jobs. And I, I think that's probably a bit low in number. We're gonna do the study again next year and improve the, uh, the or update the numbers. The programs generated 154.1 million in household income to local residents. The creative economy delivers 23.2 million in local and state government revenue. This impact study shows and sends us a strong uh, signal that when we support the arts, we are not we not only enhance the quality of our lives, but we also invest in the economic well being of the state of Hawaii. According to the National Endowment for the Arts in a report last month, Hawaii spends 1,871 uh, $1, to $2,917 on folk and <laughs> apologies, folk and traditional arts doing funding uh, per capita per 10,000 people. This is one of the highest rates in the nation. Hawaii has a diversity of arts cult and culture and humanity workers and businesses that we include in this broad label of creative. Now more than ever, we need to collaborate, make space for diversity of creative expressions. We need more public venues. We need to find ways to support and employ creatives from Native Hawaiian, Pacific Island, and Pacific Rim communities who are residents in Hawaii. These are some of the reasons why we need the Creative Resurgence Caucus in the state legislature to ad advocate for the creative sector. Mahalo nui for your time. Mm, mahalo nui, Terry. Thank you so much for all your incredible work um, in being an advocate and a foundation for this initiative. Um, the Creative Caucus, you know, dedicated to representing the incredibly diverse ecosystem of arts, genealogies, ethnicities, talents, and abilities from across the Pacific, as Terry was sharing, and beyond, um, and really is looking at the social response and economic recovery here in Hawaii. Um, the foundation of our cultural heritage is rooted in Native Hawaiian ways of knowing and being. Um, up next, Snowbird Puanani O Paua Kalani Bento is the Kumu Hula of the multi award winning Halau Hula, Kapahula O Kalele Hua. Having gained this tradition, traditional title through a series of uniki, a traditional graduation process, bestowing upon the recipients uh, kuliana, privilege and responsibility to transfer the wisdom and knowledge of her teachers and their hula genealogies to her students. She's a lifelong learner and educator, having taught from preschool through the collegiate levels. Snowbird has worked continuously at Kamehameha schools for the last 27 years, starting as a teacher assistant in the high school performing arts department and currently serving as a cultural consultant 
in the uh, Ho'okahua uh, Cultural Vibrancy Division. She's a standing president of the Lalakea Foundation, a nonprofit organization comprised of kumuhula throughout Hawaii. The foundation's mission is to perpetuate the ancient art form of hula and other cultural practices. She is also a commissioner on the 13th Festival of Pacific, uh, of Pacific Arts and Culture, slated to be hosted by Hawaii in 2024. Music, hula, Hawaiian language, and culture are part of the foundation of who and why she is. Without further ado, Kumu Snow, Snowbird Bento. Mahalo. Mahalo, Lala. Aloha kakahiaka, uh, Senator Taniguchi, and members of the Senate Committee on Labor, Culture, and the Arts. Uh, my name is Snowbird Puanani Opawa Kalani Bento, and I am born and raised in Pawa Valley, Oahu. I'm an educator, a hula practitioner, and an advocate for integrating Hawaiian cultural ways of learning and knowing through the acquisition of knowledge that's rooted in our kupuna wisdom and combined with the technologies and lessons of the present in order to create social change equity and empower the next generation of learners to become the next generation of our local and global leaders. This morning, I'd like to share a personal story as to why we need a creative resurgence caucus. I'm a child of this place. And as such, I have an inherent obligation to steward and cultivate this place for the future generations of those who will call Hawaii their home. My cultural identity defines who I am based on the place that I occupy and this space that has been part of my genealogical ancestral DNA from time immemorial. I grew up in a house that was filled with music. Music was the way and continues to be one of the ways that my family communicates. How we show our emotions, uh, how we unify together, even how we deal with hardship and loss. My mother is a hula dancer, has been all my life. My uncle is a musician and was part of the Hokule Asaga album that received a Nahoku Hanohano Award, gosh, back in the 70s. But my uncle's story is that he could not make a living off of his creative passions alone. And so he became a fireman. And he was a federal firefighter for many, many years before he became an OSHA certified uh, safety inspector. And I watched him create a life for himself and his ohana, not off of his passion, but off of the need to be able to survive in Hawaii. I'm influenced by my time as a student at Kamehameha Schools. It allowed me to elevate and expand my knowledge and my wisdom, the experiences through the culture and the arts. I knew that I loved music. I just didn't know how much. And it was as my time as a student that helped to kind of foster that growth, uh, participating in song contests, be becoming part of the Ho'ike production team for, for many years. Um, it allowed me to work hand in hand with the Polynesian Voyaging Society as well, being at different landfalls for Hokulea and Hikianalia. Um, even for homecomings. Um, it has also influenced and informed the current work that I do uh, in education with Ho'okahua. Um, as we look at um, our technological advances and the opportunities that this virtual va'a, if you will, will help to continue to uh, carry the message of education and the importance of our cultural identity throughout the rest of the world. Education is a medium of transference of culture and the arts. They go hand in hand. There's no doubt in my mind that keiki who have been influenced by the culture and the arts thrive and survive 
in their regular studies because they want to continue to grow in, and learn to communicate in this way. All of these things help to inform me throughout my lifetime and will continue to inform me about how and why I interact with my environment the way I do, whether it's my immediate environment and my ohana around me or my community at large or even the global community that we are all very much a part of. But my uncle's story is one of the equity of life, the equity of the quality of life. All of our lives in Hawaii, are touched by culture and the arts in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's in tourist programming, whether it's in the production of the very first Hawaiian language-based theatrical production to be held and premiered at the University of Hawaii Manoa's Kennedy Theater, to sold out audiences, seven out of eight performances sold out saying to us, there is a need and an audience for this type of culture and arts experience. But most often we are treated as secondary parts of this economy, rather than as equals in the success and the survivance of our economies, whether it be in tourism, in uh, promoting uh, theater or participating in global conversations with the leading international groups that look to indigenous wisdoms to inform current practice. So how do we provide for a quality of life that every person is inherently deserving of so that we can live in this place we call home? How do we provide and care for our creative sector as contributors to the overall health and well-being of our island home and our economies? How do we empower our future leaders to think of sustainable ways to provide for our people, and not just our future leaders, but our current leaders as well? Those questions can be answered in the need for Creative Resurgence Caucus because every single one of us have been touched by culture and the arts here in Hawaii and will continue to be touched by the influences of our culture and our arts for the next hundred generations. We need to see our creatives as an equal part of the sustainability of our economy and our island home. Mahalo nui for your time. Aloha. Mahalo nui kumu snowbird for sharing your mana'o and invaluable gifts of cultural proliferation in this space today. Um, mm. Next, I would like to introduce someone I have been inspired and impacted by over the years. Uh, Dr. Vilsoni Haranico is a professor of the Creative Academy at UH, a filmmaker, storyteller, weaver, an embodiment of Pacific Island excellence. Filsoni's life's work reflects the importance of the Pacific Island worldview and the influence that Hawaii's creative sector. I've had the privilege of facilitating community discussions with him as a guest speaker, as well as host a debut showing of one of his powerful, powerfully profound films, Let the Mountain Speak. Please welcome Dr. Vilsoni Haranico into the space. Mahalo, Vili. Mahalo. <clears throat> Could I ask someone to unmute my video? You, um... Okay, great. And we should be having a presentation as well, Vasoni. Let us know if you need help with that. So um, <clears throat> I want to uh, thank everyone for the opportunity for me to share my personal story when I was asked to be part of this effort uh, to draw attention to the importance of the arts. I, I felt that this was important for me to do. And in sharing my story, 
I hope it will draw attention to the importance of creativity. Um, it was very moving for me to hear a snowboard uh, a bento story about her uncle who had to do something else instead of following his passion. I'm the lucky ones who has made a living by following my passion. And what is that? From a very early age, my father told me stories, the so-called myths and legends of my island. Those stories sustained me on my island for 16 years. I worked very hard, got an education, and even though my family was very poor, I was the youngest of 11 children, many times there was no food to eat, I managed to get a scholarship. And from then onwards, my education was funded through scholarships. And I believe that the secret was I continued to follow my passion, which is a love of storytelling. My father also taught me how to weave from coconut fronds at the age of 10. Today, I will share my story about how during the pandemic, this so-called traditional practice that my father taught me, helped me heal and helped me share this gift with my friends and improve not only just my quality of life, but theirs, theirs as well. <clears throat> so I have prepared a um, screen presentation, which I would like um, to share with you. Creatives, including artists, are essential workers in our society and our economy, helping us recover, reflect, and rebuild. So I want to provide evidences in support of this assertion. On my island of Rotuma, when I was growing up, uh, it's uh, nine miles by two, about 2,000 Polynesian people live there. Uh, it's uh, 300 miles north of Fiji. Coconut trees were everywhere. That's what a coconut grove looks like. And all those trees are heavily laden with coconuts. No one on my island was afraid of a coconut falling on their head. In fact, I never heard of anyone dying from a coconut falling on their head. So when I first arrived in Hawaii 30 years ago to teach at the University of Hawaii, I was shocked to see all these coconut trees in Waikiki and around Honolulu with no coconuts on them. And so I wrote this poem that goes like this, like eunuchs, they grace the shoreline of Waikiki Beach. Coconut trees without coconuts, symbols of lost identities, exotic images as a backdrop for semi-naked tourists lounging on the beach. And for the past 30 years, I have always wanted to restore coconuts to the coconut trees of Honolulu. I mentioned that my father was a storyteller and fired my imagination. He told me and my siblings stories of heroes like Maui who set out with a goal in mind and they came back having achieved that goal. And through these stories, I knew that there was hope that I did not have to remain poor for the rest of my life. Today, I am invited to schools here in Hawaii, an elementary school not too far from here, to tell stories that remind me of the stories that my father told me when I was growing up. And these stories inspire the children of Hawaii. I told two stories recently, and at the end of that, I got about 60 of these thank you 
notes about a story I told them about a race between a swordfish and a hermit crab. It's a story with the moral that if you bully people, that if you terrorize people in the way that the swordfish terrorized the sea creatures and challenged the hermit crab to a race only to lose and die in the process. These two are examples of notes I got back. It's better that better to be nice rather than to be mean. To Mr. Billy, I really like how you told the story and did different kinds of voices for rushing parts and others. I really admire you for telling your amazing story, Adra Irwin. Thank you for spending time out of your day to tell us a story. I like the moral of the story. Story has the power to transform our lives. During the pandemic, after the first lockdown, when I went to look at the coconut trees of Waikiki, and because everyone was in hiding, the coconuts returned. I was so inspired by the coconuts that were back on the trees. And so I wrote a fable inspired by the pandemic. And this I am making into a film that uses animation and live action. I got funding from UH Manoa for the tune of 20,000 to make this film. I'm making a second short film funded by Pacific Islanders in Communications about my response to the COVID pandemic. And I draw attention to how the restoration of the coconuts to the coconut trees of Waikiki inspired me and gave me hope. I'm making a third short about coconut related cultural treasures and objects in museums around the world especially in Europe. This is in collaboration with a funding body from Germany, who is very interested in the theme of indigeneities in the future. How do indigenous people navigate their way into the future? I'm also making a doc that compares new culture between my home island of Rotuma and Hawaii and working collaboratively with Noel Kahanu, amongst others, and we are writing a grant for that. Here are some examples of the conceptual art for the telling of the origins of the coconut tree for the people of Oceania. For many of these cultures, the coconut tree was a gift from the spirit world to sustain us for the rest of our lives. I am part of a movement called New Now, spearheaded by Manu Maya and Indrajit Kusanakera at UH West Oahu. We have had six webinars in the last six months where people come together and share their knowledge about new culture in an effort to restore this to Hawaii, especially during the pandemic which has drawn attention to our needs to support our local farmers, local produce, buying not only new, but taro and ulu, for example. These things are meant to sustain us. What happened? We do not have to be so dependent on important foods. Our last webinar was about art in relation to new culture. Indrajit Gunasakara, who is from Sri Lanka, which is the most um, important place for new culture in the whole world, where coconut front weaving and new is very much a spiritual practice. All these things are made from coconut front leaves and they're about transition in life for the uh, um, for the people who live there. We also had Hanalei who shared with us his incredible work about how he uses um, 
um, Senate uh, to bound things together. And it is spiritual practice, it is cultural practice that draws from new related objects in museums. And he takes what he learns and he creates incredible works of art from coconut fronds. Mahi also talked about how he draws from museum examples of his ancestors and creates new products using coconut shells for other ceremonies and even for his own use at home. Noel Kahanu talked about the way Pacific Islanders use the coconut tree in their, in their paintings, in their work, to comment on what has happened to this place. Here's a famous picture of Captain Cook and what happened to him in Hawaii. The artist, I believe his name is Drew, whitewashes it, and we are left with this image of just the coconut trees. I love the fact that there are coconuts on these trees. People come and go, but the coconut tree remains. The coconut tree for me is very much like my elder sibling, in much the same way that the taro is an elder sibling for the Hawaiian people. During the pandemic, I realized that I have this talent for weaving that was latent because I went and got a Western education. Now I weave these baskets from abandoned leaves when Polynesian men and locals removed the leaves of the trees near where I live in Honolulu and they are by the roadside. I go there and I try to see if I can salvage a leaf or two. Usually I have to almost fight with the men there because they think I'm a homeless person. And what was I doing foraging? It doesn't cost anything to make these things. I submitted a basket to the Hawaii Craftsman Annual Statewide Exhibition that started in 1967. They accepted a basket I made, and I believe for the first time, a coconut front basket. This humble basket made from an abandoned leaf was able to find a place in this exhibition of very talented artists. 400 submissions, about 65 was chosen. My humble basket was one of them. The arts reflect and explain who we are or should be. They help us heal and they improve the quality of our lives. And this is why we need a creative resurgence focus. This is why I want to share my story today, to draw attention to this tree of life that once upon a time was the most important tree for the Hawaiian people. Once upon a time, it was the most important tree for the Hawaiian people. For the rest of Oceania, it still is. We have an opportunity, especially now that the pandemic has thrown into stark relief how important it is to be truly who we are. There's a coconut grove outside Hilton Hawaiian Village. During the pandemic, I go there and I look at the trees. Coconuts came back to this coconut grove and they went to full maturity because everyone was more or less in hiding. There is an opportunity to educate people about this tree of life and bring it back, bring it back to its former glory. Here in Hawaii, I feel that we are wimps. We are afraid of a coconut falling on our heads. More people are killed on the road driving than a coconut falling on our head. Are we not able to figure out a solution to this problem? 
the coconut tree has become the most maligned, the most alienated, the most oppressed, just like the Hawaiian people. Just like the Hawaiian people. It's such a sad story. We can be like Sri Lanka, where we are not afraid of the coconut tree. This is the tree of life. And if today I have been able to draw attention to the need to bring this tree back to Hawaii and its people, it's meant to sustain us for the rest of our lives. And this is why a creative resurgence caucus is so, so important. Thank you. Mm. Mahalo nui, Vili, for sharing this incredible story, so ancient yet so relevant to our present day circumstances and experiences. Oh. Creative Resurgence Caucus is a critical vessel to advocate for the integration of arts and culture into solutions that will support community well being. The state's economic priorities and our next generation's artists, educational abilities, and needs. Up next, um, you know, I, I haven't been able to meet her in person, um, but the next artist we celebrate today is Raya Helm. A Hawaiian musician vocalist who is inspiring younger generations in preserving the authentic authenticity of mele. Originally from Molokai, Raitea comes from a legacy of musical talent and cultural resilience, best known for her leo kie kie, Hawaiian falsetto. Raitea's success as an artist includes many prestigious awards, including two Grammy nominations, six Nahoku Hanohano Awards, a Native Hawaiian Arts and Cultural Fellowship, being the first Hawaiian female vocalist nominated for a Grammy. Raitea is currently working towards a university degree in musicology at UH Manoa, with an emphasis in Hawaiian music, language, and culture. Most recently, she's expanding her gifts through teaching, passing on a lineage of passion, talent, and aloha, inspiring the next generation to preserve and proliferate the authenticity of knowledge and culture through mele. It's my honor to introduce Raya Teahom. Mahalo. Mahalo, Lala. Thank you so much. And mahalo nui to Senator Taniguchi and the Senate Committee for Labor, Culture, and the Arts. Thank you for allowing me to share my passion and love for Hawaiian music today. I'm also here to support all island artists. My late uncle, George Jared Helm Jr. played a pivotal role during the Hawaiian Renaissance of the 1970s. His love and dedication for Kaho Olave brought awareness to cultural identity and mele Hawaii. Culture, music, and art all are inseparable. If you lose one, in essence, you lose the other. Our kuleana today is to nurture those elements that make our culture unique. If we don't, we will lose our Hawaiian essence. After several years of exploring traditional Hawaiian music and jazz, performing with the Honolulu Symphony, to performing in a band with Mick Fleetwood and Willie Kay, all these were instrumental in my growth and appreciation of Hawaiian music. When I first started to get into Mele Hawaii, my father introduced me to the music of Lena Machado, Lena Kelly Ivahamana, Lena Alahaili, Genoa Keave, Mahi Ai Beamer, and others. In recent years, I learned more about other historical Hawaiian vocalists and musicians, such as Elaine Ako Spencer, Mikia Kealakai, Alfred Apaka Jr., famous Hawaiian tenor Tandy McKenzie, Nami Alapai, vocalist of the Royal Hawaiian Band under Henry Berger, and the list goes on and on. We have such a rich history of Hawaiian music. The reason I chose to go back to school was to explore other ways to use my voice and to underline the importance of education to the next generation. In 2017, I gravitated to the music of Queen Liliuokalani through Antinola Nahulu's Hawaiian chorus at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. The following year, 
I found myself collaborating on a musical project spearheaded by Uncle Moon Kawakahi and the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra in which I sang Kawai Apolani. The venture was put together by Lili Uokalani Trust. I never imagined that performance would lead me full circle to serve in that organization. Lili Uokalani Trust has allowed me to carry on this legacy of bringing authenticity to Hawaiian mele while allowing our kamali'i to explore many other realms of music, whether traditional or contemporary. Historically, any culture's demise begins with dismantling the glue which holds the culture together. In Hawaii, that glue is language through mele and hula. It is therefore instrumental to ensure and maintain that cultural peace so that we don't lose what it means to be Hawaiian. We must continue to foster Hawaiian culture through the arts, and that is why I support the Creative Resurgence Caucus. Mahalo again for giving me the opportunity to support what has become my life mission, Hawaiian culture and art. Mm, mahalo nui raitea. Mahalo for your work in uplifting our community through your voice and through the incredible work you're doing with our youth through the Leo Kalani Trust. Up next, acclaimed and bodily, uh, boldly creative arts leader, Dave Moss, is the new executive director of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. A recovering violinist, Dave has performed at venues from Disney um, Concert Hall to Carnegie Hall, Madison, Madison Square Garden to Coachella, and was equally at home performing with The Who, Kanye West, Renee Fleming, or in a Broadway production of Hamilton. He holds music performance degrees with the Juilliard School and Oberlin Conservatory of Music, and an MBA in finance and economics from the University of Chicago. In the midst of the pandemic, the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra has been in production with the sound of resilience, amplifying how more determined, united, inspired than ever the collaborative resilience of artists are during these challenging times. Um, and want to invite the public that they can virtually uh, tune in from the conference of their home to watch and listen live uh, via live stream, concert being broadcasted from the Hawaii Theater. Great to have you with us today, Dave, and mahalo, mahalo for being here. Good morning, and thank you so much for the opportunity to join you this morning and to speak on behalf of the Creative Resurgence Initiative here. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and I, I must admit that I'm, I'm truly humbled to be invited to this table uh, to share my experience and to advocate on behalf of our cultural organization. If the suit and tie are not a clear indication, I am indeed quite new to Hawaii. I began my tenure with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra just back on March 10th, and little did any of us know how quickly the world would soon change. As you can imagine, our business model at the HSO was firmly planted in revenue from in-person events. As a nearly $5 million organization employing 64 salaried musicians with health and benefits, 12 full-time employees, and the countless stagehands, parking attendants, and front of house staff that welcome our community to performances. The pandemic has made our future a bit daunting uh, and something that really truly keeps me up night after night. Our success was previously defined as having 3,000 people in the Blaisdell Concert Hall, an idea that now eight months into this global pandemic is but a fleeting memory. Speaking of memories, I like to use this metaphor when talking about the importance of the arts. For a moment, think back to the celebrations in your life. Think about to the tragedies. Think about your favorite films or the times you could gather safely with your ohana. Is there a soundtrack? Or do you find yourself reciting a line of arithmetic or perhaps the Pythagorean theorem? We as the artists, the musicians, the painters, the poets, the dancers are indeed second responders. We step in to bring healing, to uplift, and to offer reflection to the depressed and anxious communities. This was indeed the impetus behind the launch of Sounds of Resilience, our live streaming program that began back in September. As a mission-driven organization, our mission is to provide our community with music, no matter the circumstances. 
We recognized how difficult the cir circumstances were, but sacrificed to keep the music alive. It might have been easier for us to just step away from this mission, to take a year off, but the support of our community has demonstrated how music can significantly enrich, heal, and inspire our lives. What happens next as we emerge into a resilient future for the arts and culture here in Hawaii? When you think of the HSO, you probably think of Beethoven, Brahms, perhaps Mahler, you know, all those old dead men of Western canon that have defined, quote, classical music for the better part of three centuries. Well, not me. Uh, when I think of the symphony, I think of a medium for change. I think of a sonic power of 84 individuals all coming together without necessarily saying a word to communicate. We aspire to the day when our symphony again collaborates with local talent like Riotana and work with up and coming artists such as Isaac, Kimmy Minor, Josh Totofi, the list goes on and on and, and really harken back into the Hapahali tradition that was formed here back in the 1920s with a symphony orchestra as the backdrop. We go further back and, and the tradition of, of the arrival of Henry Berger in 1870 with Western music tradition beginning to merge seamlessly with Hawaiian tradition. These past eight months have shown us just how resilient the arts can be and what the future can look like if we adapt. The future holds the opportunity for the arts and culture sector to play a larger part in the diversification of an economy and to play a role in a respectful return to tourism for Hawaii. Music and art create a sense of place that is truly unrivaled by any other industry. From an economic perspective, the arts and culture sector contributes over 2.5 billion combined to our local economy, and it employs over 12,000 individuals here in Hawaii. We have the economic data that truly shows the impact when investment is made to support the arts. On average, every $1 that is invested into this sector, nearly $6 in taxable revenue is returned. A recent report in the state of Vermont showed a 775% return on investment when just 500,000 was invested into the performing arts. We have an opportunity as we emerge from this pandemic to shape our local arts and culture sector to be truly reflective of this community. And this is our top priority here at the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. As we plan for our future, a future which the Hawaii Symphony is rooted in being an organization that reflects the entire state of Hawaii, by being uniquely of, for, and by Hawaii. Mahalo for your time, and I eagerly look forward to our continued work together and for our community. Mahalo Nui, Dave, for sharing your story of resilience. Um, being brand new to Hawaii and taking on this kuleana to continue to make music accessible to our communities during these times is so incredibly important. Mahalo Nui. Um, our next speaker, I've recently gotten to know and be inspired by. George Kahn has worked with students um, as the director of T-Shirt Theater for 40 years. He's mentored students at Farrington High School in the Performing Arts Learning Center. Through the pandemic, his students are still producing theatrical performances, which has pivoted to adapt to the virtual world. It is a great pleasure and joy to introduce a new and dear friend, George Kahn, to the space. Aloha, George, and welcome. Mahalo, Lala. And thanks, Senator Taniguchi, for shining some light on creative resurgence. You and I go back to 1980, yeah? T-shirt theater has made its home at Farrington since 1985. When COVID hit, we lost Farrington's funding, which was one quarter of our annual budget. Ouch, but we're jaunty. That means if you push us down, we bounce right back up, just like the Daruma doll. Because that's what creatives do. We find a better way. Last spring, I thought T-shirt theater had three Chukis boys until one day, Ethan, who looks like Dave Moss, says, I'm Chukis. And every time I go to a family party, they ask, hey, what you doing here, Haole boy? And I have to say, I'm half Chukis. Uh, that's my mom over there. We called his scene Looks the Part. It was a funny scene and wise. And when we showed it to Farrington, <laughs> it brought down the house. Here's the part though. The next day in the hallways, the boys were looked at with different eyes. 
they were stopped and congratulated, not ignored, not put down. The shyest of the three boys, Ben, had an epiphany. Wow, our scenes change people's hearts. That's a power of art. Why don't we form a club for Pacific Islanders? 45 kids joined up and Mike for Peace won first place at the Farrington Homecoming Banner Contest. They were just three weeks old. Writing their wave, I challenged them. If you write a script, I will help you put it on stage with T-Shirt Theater Spring Show. They did just that in January. Come March, we're getting ready. We announced it to the school, sold out performances, COVID hit. So they created a solid play. Celebrate Micronesia Festival asked for a video a few weeks ago. And it's already been seen by over 10,000 people. So. Here's a clip from Mike for Pieces Deep in Our Roots. Okay, George, click on share screen. Yep. Teaching me about protocols. 
protocols. Protocols. Yeah. He talked to me a lot about protocols and not letting other people's opinions affect me. Look at us. Does it look like we let what people say affect us? I grew up here. I had to deal with it. If they see that my friends are violent, they'll think that I'm violent. See, I don't like that. They think that we, we're all the same people. We have to change that. We're such humble and decent people. Yeah. I'm tired of seeing my image being destroyed by a stereotype. Yeah. We have to show others that we are not what they say we are. Maybe we can start with small gatherings for Micronesia. Oh, we can start a club. It's something we can do together to help change people's perspectives on other Micronesians. Come on, bro. We just ignore the negativity and stay positive and supportive of each other. That positivity will affect our surroundings and they'll see that we are all great people. Man, this is like what I saw in my dream. Pop a ball. Pop a ball. Yeah, man. Use the stars to navigate his destination. It's like we're up a mall and this group of travelers searching for peace. And that's why we as Micronesians should stick together and show what our people are really like. Say positivity will surely do something, but we're not going to do much without our community's help. It's like in our culture, our villages always come together to help each other, right? Yes, we're nothing without one another. Together, we can create a move. I'm in. Me too. Me three. Change. 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 And that's why we need creative resurgence. Mahalo. Mahalo nui, George. And mahalo to the youth for embodying their creative and cultural brilliance despite the adversity they face. Uh, I'm so honored and so inspired by this work. <sighs> Up next, it is so good to introduce a nationally known, actually internationally known artist and educator with a physics and poetry background. Keloha is a known slam poet and a poet laureate of Hawaii. I've had the honor of listening and working with Keloha over the years, whether that was at a First Fridays, Arts at Mark's Garage, or at the East West Center. It's been a while since we have seen each other. Um, and so I'm excited to share this virtual space with you, brother. Um, and I'm honored to introduce my dear friend and epic human, Kealoha. Right on. Thank you, Lala. Um, aloha, my kako, everybody. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm born and raised here in Honolulu. Um, and I have had a pretty windy path. Um, so the way it goes is this, is that I, like growing up, I never would have said that I was an artist or that I even valued art. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, um, to me, I was an engineer, I was mathematics, I was physics, I was science. Uh, those were the things that I thought made the world spin. Yeah. Um, and so that was my mindset for like a big chunk of my life. When I was in high school, though, um, on just some random Wednesday or something like that, we all got shuffled into an assembly uh, where we were going to hear uh an up-and-coming artist reads some poems or read from a book that she had just written uh, her name was lois ann yamanaka and she was reading from saturday night at the pahala theater um and that morning um what i witnessed uh completely changed my viewpoint of what art was uh and what art could be um so i sat there and i heard this 
wonderful woman speaking my voice. It was, it was, as, it was as if she had uh, gone into my head and started speaking for me. And what I realized then was that, you know, poetry wasn't just uh, the stuff you could read in books. Um, it wasn't just old men from a long time ago. It was a living, breathing culture. Um, and I, I had a spark ignited in me that day uh, that stuck with me for the rest of my life. Um, of course, I still continued on with my mathematics and science and all of that. Um, and I went on and got a degree in nuclear engineering. But eventually, uh, when I was living in San Francisco, uh, the poetry thing came around again. I, I got uh, introduced to a, 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 an art form called uh, Poetry Slam or Performance Poetry. Uh, and that's when that initial experience of Lois and Yamanaka in my assembly, uh, as well as combined with my experience in San Francisco, uh, led me to go on to a whole new career path, which was to become a performance poet. Um, I've been doing uh, this professionally for almost 17, 18 years. Um, and a big chunk of that has been spent working with the artists in the schools program, um, going into schools uh, and trying to create that same spark that was given to me by Lois and Yamanaka when I was in high school. Um, so that's kind of like the general thesis of where I'm coming from and why I support the creative resurgence efforts and that um, what I witnessed in high school was an act of art that I was not expecting. It was an act of art in a public place where I did not go to it. I did not sign up for it. I was presented with it and it changed my life. Um, and I think those instances where we can bring art to people when they're least expecting it, uh, when they feel like, you know, like, cause you know, it's easy to just con uh, speak to the choir, but when you can convert um, someone who, uh, who, who wasn't ready for that, um, I think that's when art has its most profound impacts. And that's, that's, that's like anything we can do uh, to creatively bring more art to more people, um, I believe is what we need in, in our current modern day society, uh, including this pandemic uh, situation and beyond. I mean, I, 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 you know, this effort is not just about how we respond to the pandemic, but it's about how we uh, continue to foster a, a strong artistic movement um, that makes us better people and better humans overall. So that's kind of what I wanted to share today to, in support with the resurgence. Oh, mahalo nui, ke aloha. So, so appreciate, miss you and hope to see you in person sooner than that. <laughs> yeah, <then. laughs> for sure. Uh, so, you know, ke aloha's story is an example of life path and career in reflection of why a, st a state caucus dedicated to representing the incredibly diverse ecosystem of arts, genealogies, ethnicities, talents, and abilities from across the Pacific and beyond that are home right here in Hawaii. Um, with that, I am excited and can't think of another, um, anyone more fitting, in my opinion, to share a lifetime and lineage of insight and experience that has contributed to the proliferation of the culture, arts, literature, and art spaces in Hawaii. Maile Meyer, whom I considered ohana and beloved mentor, is the founder of Namea Hawaii, Native Books, Pu'ohonua Society, Aupuni Space, and most recently, Miley has teamed up with the Bye Bye Collective, opening a new creative co-working space, art space called Arts and Letters, located on New Uwano Street in Chinatown, Honolulu, previously the Peggy Hopper Gallery. Miley has played a critical role as a consultant, project manager, facilitator, advocate, and placemaker for contemporary Native Hawaiian and Pacific Island art <clears throat> that spans from grassroots community initiatives um, to projects with Disney Aulani, Sheraton Waikiki, Hawaii Convention Center, yeah. Pow Wow Hawaii, just to name a few. I could go on, but I will not, and instead 
we'll offer Miley the floor. Mahalo Miley for being here today. Lala, you just thank you for so much for everything that you do. Bless you. Benina Mai, greetings to you, Senator Tanaguchi, and members of your vital committee that includes a focus on culture and the arts. After listening to our speakers, I'm so grateful to be in the company of people who make my heart sing. And that's, that's what we need right now, to lift our voices in every form of soulful expression, to believe that we will thrive and here in our islands under any and all adversity. We have in the past, and no one knows it better than the Hawaiian community. No one knows it better than artists, what isolation and, and pandemics feel like. But you know what? We will continue. We all sing a different song, but it's still a song. We all paint a different scene, and each of us sees it as we do. That's the truth. The beauty of creativity is that we recognize ourselves in each other and we express ourselves at our deepest level when we have that empathy for other. That's why a coalition and a collaborative effort is incredible. It's so right. And we're going to do it whether you guys support us or not. Just kidding. Anyway, <clears throat> my art origin story is a simple one. My mother, Emma Aluli Meyer, was the PTA president at St. Anthony's Church in Kailua with seven children in tow. She was determined to bring arts and culture to the country, which really was Kailua in the 70s. With the help of a donation from an art supporter, in parentheses, legislative support as an example, an incredible artist and gallerist named Chuck Wellborn and a team of volunteers that took shifts watching the gallery, setting up chairs, cleaning after workshops and classes. Two of those volunteers was my sister, Meliana, who's a filmmaker, artist, and advocate, and myself. And this is a picture I just wanted to show you of the original Young of Heart workshop and gallery that became Pu'uhonua Society. It was a 501c3. It's actually the oldest 501c3 in the state, apparently, I didn't know this, in the 70s, dedicated to art and culture, started by my mother. It continues today as the Pu'uhonua Society. But I was one of those two volunteers out of the team of 40. And Melly and I have been putting away chairs and sweeping floors and art spaces, art spaces since I was a young child. I saw through young eyes and for a lifetime, the impact of art, culture, music, dance has on our species. And it's not tied to money. It's tied to access and experience. We are moved through creativity in ways that we do not need to quantify or measure. You need to, I don't. Whether you lift up this caucus or not, we will all holomua, because that is the nature of creative people. All of the ventures I've been involved in create pathways to recognize and celebrate what is unique about this place, this paiaina. This is where we are. We're connected in the middle of the ocean through the waterways. It's amazing what we can do understanding that connectivity. I'll give you a few short examples um, from my experiences. I'll use books. 30 years ago, there were no living Hawaiian authors, only those from the past. Now, Namiya Hawaii native bookshelves are lined with Hawaiian poets. My phone is gonna die, by the way. I'm plugging in my thing, my little charger. Our shelves are lined with poets, scholars, novelists, and illustrators. It's not a miracle. It's an opportunity that comes with understanding resources, creating access, education, and a myriad of other variables, some of which you, Senator, and your committee can create and facilitate. We've done heavy lifting. The caucus has been meeting, the resurgence, creative resurgence group, they've been amazing. So there's plenty that everybody can contribute, and this is your moment. Sometimes because of our own history and unexamined biases, the audiences for impetus and change are outside. We just don't think we have it. Until Disney came to Hawaii with the Aladi Hotel. It's embarrassing. The largest co private collection of native Hawaiian art in Hawaii was commissioned by the new GM of Sheraton, Waikiki, Kelly Sanders, with Hawaiian architect Rob Iopa. Disney saw the collection in a hotel that we helped to organize along with an incredible group of 
public school, private school, a collaborative group of young people, an incredible Maoli artist who stayed in the hotel. That group, Disney saw the collection on the walls of the Sheraton Waikiki, and they believed and they saw the talent of our local artists. And they added a million dollars worth of local art to the Aulani Hotel. And that was a long time ago. The recent commitment by Hawaii State Art Museum to showcase the work of Native Hawaiian contemporary art at the museum right now and artists from their collection across the Pacific is a huge step towards celebrating ourselves through our own resources. Blessings to Karen Ewald and to JJ, John Johnson for really understanding where our strengths and resources ex ex uh, exist in us. The upcoming Contemporary Art Summit in the Triennial, it creates a profound method of exchange between local, national and international communities. And it's gonna be housed here on Oahu and throughout the islands in all of our places and at Iolani Palace. We do not have to look any further. We are the solution we are looking for. We have the capacity and a nature for collaboration because of who we are and where we live. No other place in the world can, can do what we could do. So just listening to everybody, honestly, bless you all and Lala for organizing us. I belong to the Art Alliance and I, I'm supposed to be, and Terry Skillman and all of the caucus members. Truly, this is our time to show Nohona Hawaii, a way that is in our DNA to work together. Bring what you have to offer. Don't be stingy, be generous. Snowbird, just hearing what, what you had contributed, that is the pa, the foundation that we all are standing on, the rooted culture of this place. Let us celebrate how we work together to accomplish things. We are a model. So that is why, for so many reasons, I'm part of the Creative Resurgence Caucus. Bless you all for being part of it as well. Mahalo, Lala. Mahalo, Nui, Maile, Maile. Thank you so much for the prolific amplification of cultural resilience and brilliance that you've gifted our people in place with in so many other places around the world. And crying is good. We all need a good cry about now. So don't Ew. feel that emotion <laughs> is important. And because I'm creative, I can cry anytime I want. <laughs> Uh, More to laughter and crying, all of all of that, please. Mahalo, Maile. Uh, last but uh, surely not least, um, accomplished as an award-winning recording artist, pianist, composer, music scholar, and cultural practitioner. Practitioner. Our next speaker, Erin J. Sala, is a Hoku Hanuhanu Award winner and a 2016 National Fellow in Music for the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. Trained classically in voice and piano, as well as in Hawaiian chant, Erin has performed in such renowned venues as Carnegie Hall, Wembley Arena, the Wilton Basilica, and Hawaii Theater Center. His sought after talents as a choral conductor, arranger, uh, and arranger have led him to work with Kamehameha Schools, with Bette Midler, and Kristen Chenoweth. Even um, um, ever cognizant of how his Pacific Islander culture and practice informs both his creative process as well as his worldview. Erin has been um, purposeful in seeking creative opportunities that will uplift the communities from which he comes from. An ethnomusicologist from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, he is a faculty specialist at UH West Oahu and director of cultural affairs at the Royal Hawaiian Center. It is my pleasure to welcome Erin Sala. Kavilino ke aloha me oku pakahi, aloha. Maile, I just have to say like my Thank Nakeu for our, our A'ahu here. Yes. Thank you so much, Lala, and mahalo nui to Drs. Terry Skillman and Fata Simanu for their invitation to reflect upon our meeting today. I also send a mahalo to Drs. Akemi Glenn and Simanu for bringing together the coalition known as Creative Resurgence. I want to acknowledge and mahalo Jonathan Johnson, Executive Director of the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts, 
for the steadfast work that he and his team have done to support our culture and arts community always, and especially through this time. Mahalo nui to Senator Taniguchi for hosting this meeting and for supporting the greater long-term vision of creative resurgence. The term reflection comes from the Latin reflectere, which means to bend back. The best image I can think of to impart this concept is that reflection is not simply about looking in the mirror. Reflection comes about from walking past the mirror and then turning back to look into the image that is there, to think about it, to pay attention to it, to appreciate all the curves and all the wrinkles, the out of place strand of hair, and not just to tolerate those imperfections, but to celebrate them in their perfect, in their perfectness, perfection. In an effort to help contextualize my own reflection on those who have spoken today, I want to share a story about a letter that has made its round on social media several times. In 2006, a certain Miss Lockwood, teacher at Xavier School in New York, required her English class to compose letters to a famous author. Five of those students chose to write to the famed, if not controversial, author, Kurt Vonnegut. Unlike the other authors who received letters from the students, Mr. Vonnegut responded. This is what he wrote. Dear Xavier High School and Miss Lockwood and Messrs. Perrin, McFeely, Batten, Morer, and Conjusta, I thank you for your friendly letters. You sure know how to cheer up a really old geezer, 84 in his sunset years. Kurt Vonnegut died at 85. I don't make public appearances anymore because I now resemble nothing so much as an iguana. What I had to say to you, moreover, would not take long. To wit, practice any art, music, singing, dancing, acting, drawing, painting, sculpting, poetry, fiction, essays, reportage, no matter how well or badly, not to get money and fame, but to experience becoming, to find out what's inside you, to make your soul grow. Seriously, I mean, starting right now, do art and do it for the rest of your lives. Draw a funny picture or a nice picture of Miss Lockwood and give it to her. Dance home after school and sing in the shower and on and on. Make a face in your mashed potatoes. Pretend you're Count Dracula. Here's an assignment for tonight, and I hope Miss Lockwood will flunk you if you don't do it. Write a six-line poem about anything but rhymes. No fair tenants without a net. Make it as good as you possibly can, but don't tell anybody what you're doing. Don't show it or recite it to anybody, not even your girlfriend or parents or whatever, or Miss Lockwood, okay? Tear it up into teeny weeny pieces and discard them into widely separated trash receptacles. You will find that you already have been gloriously rewarded for your poem. You have experienced becoming, learned a lot more about what's inside you, and you have made your soul grow. God bless you all. Kurt Vonnegut. As one who considers myself an artist, my initial response to this letter is, well, duh. But art has a masterful capacity to infiltrate everything we do. A deftly drafted business partnership contract is art. A perfectly coded piece of AI tech built to supplement medical work in surgery is art. Preparing the next generation of investigative journalists with standards of evidence and meticulous attention to detail is art. The letter is a powerful decree not so much to art in all its vestiges, but to the artistic necessity of becoming and to the persistent, if not insistent, voice in the head that works tire tirelessly to keep one on the journey to always becoming, empowering a soul to grow until it is integrous and powerful and limitless. Like no one else in the hierarchy and stratification of our community, it is in the DNA of artists, of creatives, to reflect upon and then reawaken or reinvent our work, as in the case of Dr. Herenico, who at the height of his career has enjoyed world renown as a filmmaker, as a literary, as a storyteller who has now refound beauty and value in someone else's trash. Or to reflect and then to be inspired, as in the case of Keloha, who through a singular incident of being in the company of a fellow artist, is open to a pivot in how he considers his own work, finding the art in science, in engineering, in math, and bringing that with him to people as he works to inspire in the same way that he was or to reflect upon our need to stand firmly upon our foundation, as in the case of Ms. Bento, whose work on behalf of her cultural practice and on behalf of our community has aligned her and those around her to become good ancestors. Or to reflect and then to look beyond and uplift the future, as in the case of Ms. Helm, 
who like Ke Aloha and Vili and Snowbird enjoys world renown for having one of the most beautiful voices that God and the universe has ever bestowed upon a human and who has acknowledged the need and, uh, and has harnessed the humility mid-career to return to education. As a role model for the youth with whom she now works, that Yatea does not know what a mentor she has become to her students. Or to reflect and then to empower, as in the case of Mr. Khan, who as a matter of his daily life worked with some of the most disenfranchised, underprivileged students in our state. His work is simple. He goes to school every day and says to these students, I see you. That simplicity belies the tremendous heavy lifting that starts with building trust in a community whose trust we don't deserve. Or to reflect and then to engage as in the case of Ms. Meyer, who as an astute businesswoman and advocate does not settle for silliness and pettiness in our community. She takes the inherent tensions in our community and commands us collectively and individually to get over ourselves because we have work to do. Sometimes the best reflections come from someone else holding up the mirror in order to challenge us to become better versions of ourselves, as is the case with Maestro Ma. In a meeting just last week, David, Dave said to me, any orchestra in the world can do Beethoven or Mahler or Dvorak, but we need every orchestra in the world to know Hawaii and the Pacific through music that we commission and we debut and we honor. And we celebrate. He is not wrong. Who better to take on the music of Hawaii and our Pacific family than us? through the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. Sometimes when someone else holds up the mirror in considering our own reflection, that someone else-ness of the one holding up the mirror washes away because in our becoming, we find that we are all on the same journey. As a result, Dave has very quickly become my brother from another mother. <laughs> we certainly need a creative resurgence caucus, one that sees the inherent and incredible value that the creative sector brings to the lifeblood of our communities and our land. And in order to establish a caucus of this kind, we must first implore our legislators and policymakers and ourselves to reflect upon the irresponsible ways in which we have cared for ourselves and our home. And then to reflect upon the need to realize, that is make real, the inherent and incredible potential that is possible when creative, painters, sculptors, Glassblowers, ballerinas, lohala weavers, writers, chanters, singers, bassists, feature filmmakers, video game developers, second language learners, administrators, pianists, actors, engineers, teachers, historians, conductors, lighting designers, kazoo players, sound women, camera people, ukulele virtuosos, stage crews, politicians, understand the need to reawaken and reconnect and research in order to uplift our whole community, they're with ourselves. Two things about Mr. Vonnegut's letter are especially striking to me. The first is that there is no fair tennis without a net. There are standards of excellence we must commit to holding ourselves to, and those standards represent the responsibility we have as creatives to imbue into our work an impeccable and unimpeachable integrity. The second piece of Mr. Vonnegut's letter that struck me is the tearing up of our poems into teeny weeny pieces in order to discard them into widely separated trash receptacles. As creatives and creators, we must harness our ego to bring life to our art. As reflections of our creation, we must maintain a steely cold calm and transcend into a true humility. Our creations are beings we birth at once for ourselves and for the world. And when we allow our creations to live on, to be carried by the wind, to take on the lives they were each meant to live, we also empower those pieces of ourselves to become in the world, in their own ways, embracing their own multiple futures. In so doing, we have also solidified our path to becoming really good ancestors. In our individual and collective journeys to becoming, we must constantly remind ourselves, we must constantly reflect upon the fact that if we have the ability to breathe, then we also have the capacity to create. And in that creativity is an artistic sense of self that is at the very core of humanity. We have to harness that creative resurgence. It will grant us the resilience to see through this extraordinary time in our lives. It is the path upon which we will find ourselves again 
And it is the way we will empower our continued becoming in the journey, not only of our own lives, but in the lives of our children and of those for generations to come. Our creative resurgence will see to it that our souls continue to grow and grow and grow. And this is why we need a creative resurgence caucus. Mahalo, aloha. Mahalo nui, nui. Mahalo nui, Aaron, for your beautiful weaving of our individual stories and amplifying our collective abilities. You know, in closing, as today's session has hopefully expressed, creatives are innovative, emergent, iterative, and purposeful. We must amplify and intentionally support those that are working in and with communities in their processes of becoming, doing, and being. The creative sector comprises diverse traditions and genres uh, of ancient and contemporary existence. Cities and states around the world are increasing, increasingly acknowledging the critical role creatives play in the resilience and existence of our society's well-being. Creativity expands far beyond forms of industry, commodity, and entertainment. It is, as Aaron said, at the core of our very existence the foundation to which we are able to continue to adapt, evolve, and thrive as a human race. Today, we're advocating for the establishment of a creative caucus in the Hawaii State Legislature to provide a point of access, agency, and advocacy for policies and programs that genuinely prioritize and invest in Hawaii's diverse arts and creative sector. Mahalo nui, Senator Taniguchi, Senate Committee for Labor, Culture, and the Arts, and all the staff for your support in hosting this important gathering. Mahalo nui for all the creative voices represented in this room today. And on behalf of this small hui of artists and advocates, we mahalo every artist, creative, and practitioner who has dedicated their purpose and career to proliferating life through creativity. I'll turn it over back to Senator Taniguchi for any questions and reflections um, as we have maybe another 15 minutes or so before our time ends together. Mahalo nui. Thank you, Lala. Um, I wanted to add my thanks to all the presenters this morning. Um, really uh, have a, has a big impact on me. Um, and I hope to all our members. Uh, the Creative Resurgence Hui has conveyed to the committee some ideas for legislative proposals, including a caucus. Um, let's all continue to work together and stay in touch. Um, before we conclude, uh, do the committee members have any comments they would like to offer? Um, I, I thought Aaron did a pretty good job of summarizing everything, but uh, any comments from any of the uh, members here today? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Kirk. Senator. How are you doing? Go ahead. Sorry. <clears throat> well, I just wanted to thank each and every one of the presenters. Um, <clears throat> very uh, uplifting, and uh, you know, it's something as as I got elected and blessed to be the senator for my community. Um, that's one of the biggest things that I advocate. Um, you know, a lot of the senators know my background. I used to be a sound person for the group Tropical Nights in Capena back in the day. So I understand the need of the gigs and um, musical art and just continuing what we need to do um, as a people of, of Hawaii. Yeah? So I just want to just thank you guys for this uh, opportunity to be here. You know, Senator Taniguchi, thank you. Um, you know, it's a great committee. I love his committee because it's very diverse <laughs> and very educated. I, I learn a lot. You know, as much as I live in Hawaii, you know, I gotta learn more about them in my in my committees with my my fellow senator. So I appreciate each and every one of you guys out there, and uh, thank you again for for uh, letting us uh, be a part of you guys' uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Anybody else? Thank you, Senator. This is uh, Representative Gates. Hello. Hey, Rep. How you doing? I, I just also wanted to say mahalo to all of the presenters today, all of the creatives. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with you folks in the future. I, I really appreciate that Senator allowed me to 
participate in this oh. info briefing today and and um, hearing the wealth of Ike and uh, Manao from all of you folks is inspiring and uh, you folks have a uh, big job at task and we're looking forward to supporting you guys uh, moving forward. So mahalo. Thank you. Thanks, Rep. Anybody, anybody else? Uh, you don't have to. Right? <laughs> okay, well, um, in that case, uh, I want to thank members and uh, thank you to all the presenters again. Um, a recording of this informational briefing will be posted soon on the legislature's uh, website at www.capital, with an O, dot Hawaii dot gov. So with that, I guess I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. Mahalo nui, everyone. Mahalo. Aloha. Aloha.